other than that, I think they're fine in court. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. You guys just come in and please sit on a blue X in the courtroom yeah. and make sure your cell phones are turned off. Sure. That's a vibrant blue power off. All rise. The court is now in session. Good morning. Please be seated. Ready? I see the state and statewide. Mr. Brugon and Mr. DePlanning's here. Are we ready or do we need some more time? We're ready, Your Honor. State? We're ready, Judge. Statewide? We're ready, Your Okay. Um, my understanding, Mr. Sarabia, is there may be people who wish to speak on behalf of the sentence or are they just here to watch? Uh, they would like to speak, Judge. Okay, um, well, why don't we go ahead and uh, have the defense attorney step down. I'll have Mr. Massey brought in and I'll have the officer speak at this time, okay? Yeah. Who do we have here to speak on behalf? Sergeant Lindsay and uh, after him, Deputy Garman. Okay, Sergeant, come on up. Good morning, sir, how are you? Good morning, I'm gonna remove this. Yes, you can take that off. For the record, this is uh, Sergeant Lindsay. Yes. Um, sir, uh, Mr. Massett is here. His lawyers are here. Please uh, tell me what you'd like to know. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to say um, that the February 21st, 2019 changed my life. That the actions of Mr. Massad on that day um, put my life and the life of my team in jeopardy. I've been a Deputy Sheriff with Pasco County for 20 years. I'm currently a SWAT team leader, and my team was charged with the duty of going in and executing a search warrant at his house. And uh, that day, without going into the whole story, some things happened that were very lucky for both the team and for Mr. Massad. We were very lucky that we had bad intelligence on what, which way that his front door swung open because it delayed the entry of the team long enough for Mr. Massad to fire rounds from his handgun in the direction that the team was entering. Had that door opened properly, my team would have been at the top of those stairs and the first member of the team would have probably taken those rounds, either in his body armor or on his person and could have very easily died that day. Since that day, um, another part of that situation is the fact that after the team retreated down behind the armor, the Bearcat, which was parked in the driveway, I sat in the passenger seat and watched Mr. Massad stand inside his doorway, waving his gun and pointing it in the direction of my team. I luckily was behind bulletproof glass of the Bearcat, but even behind that glass, I was still unsure whether or not he was gonna shoot me or one of my team members. The entire time, I was given direction to the negotiator who was trying to convince Mr. Massad to hang up the phone and come outside and surrender himself, being that the entire SWAT team was surrounding his house and we had a lawful warrant to be there. So luck, luckily for Mr. Massad, the only, as far as I know, the only person that could clearly see him point, continuing to point the firearm in the direction of the team was myself. And luckily for him, I was inside an armored car and not because if other team members had seen what I seen, I'm confident that they would have been justified in shooting him in the chest to stop the threat. So for both of our sakes, we're lucky that we didn't make it through that door and he's lucky that no one else could see what I could see on that day. After that incident, immediately following, I started suffering from anxiety and stress caused by it. To have to go home and tell my family after 20 years in law enforcement that I almost died because a politician decided that it was more important to, to shoot the first cop that came to arrest him than, than to lawfully surrender to, the, to his arrest and to the warrant. I've had nightmares, and I promise you I'll never forget the image of him standing at the top of the stairs pointing that gun at, at me and my team and, uh, and, knowing, and feeling helpless that I couldn't do anything about it while he talked on the phone with whoever he was talking to, debating on whether or not to surrender to us. I'm an educated person. I've got my bachelor's degree in criminal justice and I'm almost done with my master's degree. So I absolutely understand the purpose of attorneys. I understand that they have a responsibility to the, to the accused, to the victim and to society to make sure that people who are less educated don't get taken advantage of in the justice system. They have that responsibility to make sure that it's fair and just. But I'm telling you today, this is not fair. This is not justice. The fact that we're here entertaining a plea deal 
in a case where the defendant is accused of intentionally, willfully, and knowingly shooting a firearm at law enforcement officers during the execution of a search warrant is disgusting. I'm appalled by it as a person, as a citizen of Pasco County, and as an employee of the Sheriff's Office. Mossad has, Mr. Mossad has clearly exploited the worst flaw in the criminal justice system, and that's that money and political influence buys you freedom if you're rich. This, the fact that we're here today has caused me anxiety attacks, has caused me emotional distress, has caused my family emotional distress, and I am being victimized once again because he doesn't have to stand trial for the, for the fact that he tried to kill five police officers. The fact that we're even entertaining a three-year plea for five counts of, of attempted murder on law enforcement is appalling to me. Every, every person involved in coming up with this plea deal should be embarrassed and ashamed if they believe in the system, if they believe in justice. And as far as Dale Massad, his, his conduct during the plea hearings and during the interviews, during this investigation, have demonstrated that he is a true psychopath that lacks guilt, remorse, empathy, he's dishonest, he's a narcissist, and he has no conscience. And I'm positive that upon his release, he will continue his criminal back behavior. And I hope that the next law enforcement officers that have to go and execute an arrest warrant or any type of interaction with him are as lucky as we were that day. And I'm, I hope he's that lucky as well. I've been in the system for a long time. I've testified in a lot of cases, and this is probably the most difficult case that I've ever been involved in is because it's personal to me. I have to tell you that I still believe in the system. I still believe in justice, and I have to believe based on my faith that at some point, if he doesn't get justice in this courtroom or in this, in this circuit, that he'll get justice when he faces the God when, he's, when he finally passes away because he'll be judged for everything that he's done. Who do you want to assess? Uh, Deputy Hartman would also like to make a Good morning, Deputy. How are you? Good morning, ma'am. I have some notes on my phone. That's fine. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, Sergeant Bill Lindsay was uh, my leader that day. And uh, as he explained the uh, how it went down, I was the first member of the team to enter the residence. Uh, so I have no doubt in my mind if we hadn't had those snafus at the doorway and weren't able to get up in an expeditious manner that I would have taken those rounds either in my body armor or on my person and would have been shot by Dale Massad, who knowingly fired a law enforcement by his own admission. He knew it was the police there. He didn't think it was a burglar. He knew it was law enforcement and willfully fired at us rather than surrender to a lawful warrant. So the fact that he can do something like that shows that this man is an unstable, violent individual that has no remorse and no respect for law and order. As such, he's a danger to the community. And at some point when he gets released, there's no doubt in my mind that at some point he'll probably violate his probation. So he thinks he can do whatever he wants because he has money and political connections. And I believe that that has kind of shown itself today in the outcome of this court. And that's all I have to say about that, ma'am. Thank you for my, thank you for your time. Deputy, thank you. State, any other witnesses wish to testify? <clears throat> Okay, are we ready to proceed? With yes, the second? Sir. All right. We went over briefly um, the other day what the uh, sentence was going to be. There's a couple of things that after I went through my notes of what the agreement is, I need to clarify to make sure that we're, that we have um, clear understanding of um, Mr. Hassett, what, what is the, going to occur and what is required of him. First of all, the um, 36 months of the Department of Corrections sentence has 742 days credit time served for, for my calculation. Is that what you all are agreeing to? Yes, 741? 42. 742. Yeah, 42. Yes. And just for the record, the plea form came to my office. I put that number in. Okay. So it's on both plea forms that Mr. Massett has. Very okay. good. Um, number two is that the, um, there is a requirement that he does a psychological evaluation and counseling. That would require that he sign a HIPAA waiver to probation. That's fine. So that um, they can 
speak with the counselor and get all of the um, information on whether he is um, doing his treatment, whether there's uh, medicine that's recommended and he is taking it. If uh, there is medicine recommended, then he would have to do a pill count. So I just wanna make sure he understands with the psychological evaluation, he would have to sign a HIPAA waiver and any treatment recommended, he would have to follow, which would include med uh, medicine management. Yes, Your Honor. about that? Yes. Okay. Um, next is there's a drug evaluation and any recommended treatment that was included in the plea. And I believe this is part of the statewide case probation, and that's why I'm going over that's it. That's correct. That evaluation would have to be done within 60 days of his release to probation. That would be just getting the evaluation. That doesn't mean he has to start. But he would have to complete any recommended treatment on the first try, including any aftercare. So um, that would be included as the conditions of probation. Do you yes. see any problems with that? No, Your Honor. Um, the cost involved in this case, there is, for statewide, there was $4,688 for the statewide fee. That would be a condition of count three of 19 CF1155, which would be the first set of five years of probation. Yes, Your Honor. And then there's $550 in court costs that's also necessary. That would be on count four um, for that 19 CF1155. So I just want to make sure um, yes. I'm breaking up the cost so that he doesn't have to pay it all the first in the first probation. Yes, Your Honor, and if I could maybe add uh, to that. Um, we were advised late last night that the FDLE cost of investigation okay. um, as to the both of the 1155 and the 1580 case number combined, combined? Okay. is $103,209.62. Um, I've had discussions with, with the state about that and they want that to be a condition of probation. They're agreeable, a statewide is agreeable, that he can pay that at 500 a month with the balloon uh, before, he, before probation would be terminated. Would it be um, a condition of count three and any remaining amount would go over to count four? Yes, Your Honor, that's so fine. So it would be, a, this fee that FDLE caused would be at $500 per month minimum. Yes and it would be a condition on count three and any remaining uh, FDLE costs would be a condition of count four. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and it would stay at $500 a month for count three, and if any remains, it'd be $500 a month for count four. Yes, Your Honor. So it would just roll over from one to the other. Yes, Your the Honor. The next thing I wanted to go over with you all, what statewide is, what is the position of early term on each of the five years of probation. Because with regards to early termination, should Mr. Massive uh, be in compliance with supervision, have no other terms and conditions, for example, he's completely done with his psychological treatment, has no drug offender or drug treatment um, that's recommended, and he's done all the aftercare, and all the costs have been paid, he can certainly petition the court for consideration of early termination at a minimum of a half way. All right, so um, Mr. Massett, I just want you to go to be sure that after your DOC sentence, you have five years of probation for count three. At two and a half years, um, you can petition for early term. That'll be my decision or the decision of whatever court is here. With this status of a violent offender of special concern, which is what he would be with the aggravated assault and a law enforcement officer, he does not fall under the new statute on probation being automatic. So mm -hmm. if he violates, he doesn't automatically get a second chance, mm -hmm. and he doesn't automatically have a right to early term and half. So I just want that clear, because there is some sure. rumors out there under the new case law of who can get early term and if you get a second chance and all that under the new statute. So he would not qualify under the new statute because of the charges that the state is having to plead to. 
So um, he, can, he can apply for early term, and I have a pretty standard uh, rule around here. First of all, um, the victims will be notified, and number two, um, anybody can speak, but if everything's done and everything's paid, I usually grant early term, but in this particular case, he'd be right back on probation. So, right. it, you know, in that case, he would also have the right under count four, same thing, he can petition for early term, it is not automatic. Yes, okay? right. I just want to make that clear, he needs to make an appointment, he has to come into court, it has to be in person. Yes. And the court, probation's not just going to roll him over. Now, there was some talk early on, this was the last thing I wanted to go over, that he would somehow be moving from the state of Florida, possibly no. to live with his son or yeah. his daughter. I can't South, remember. South Florida. South Florida. Okay, yeah, so fine. within the state of Florida, uh, South Florida, um, uh, where his son is living. Okay. And it, that's fine. And uh, just so every uh, Mr. Masson knows, the court doesn't have to grant that. Right. Once he goes on probation, he will have to report to the probation officer here in Pasco. They may do it in DOC. They may have him report. After that, they can transfer to wherever he lives in the state of Florida right. without my consent or permission. Okay? Right. Um, I think that takes care of, um, we did the FDLE investigative costs. The statewide had indicated that they were reserving our restitution on Tommy Crawford. Do yes. I have that right? Yes, sir. Okay, what's the status of that? Judge, I was going through, he has voluminous medical records that we also provided in discovery trying to get the final total for his restitution for the medical payments. However, it's not easily accessible in those records. So I'm going to be working with the VA to try to get that figure. I spoke to Mr. Grunbach and I asked for 90 days in the event that I need to switch your subpoena for the bill. Um, I shouldn't have to, but I just wanted to get that 90 days just in the event that I have to do that. All right, so um, for the defense, are you agreeing that there is restitution for Mr. Crawford? Therefore, I can say that there's restitution and extend what I normally would have as a time frame for getting that amount. Yes, Your Honor, and, and um, as Peters has indicated, that basically what she's trying to isolate is the copay that's been paid on, on uh, by Mr. Crawford, and uh, we're in agreement with that there is restitution and that the reasonable amount can be determined, and we, we're okay with 90 days um, for, for statewide to gather their records. Joanna, could we possibly do it? A status. The status. Okay, you don't need a uh, status. Okay, that's fine. No. That's fine. I know. I can do it by Zoom. I don't, you don't have fine. to be here if you all agree. If you get the number before that, you can do a stipulation. Here's restitution. I sign off. I put it in. Perfect. I kind of just give, give a date so that I don't lose it, and then he gets halfway through rest, you know, his probation, and all of a sudden statewide say, oh, I forgot. Here's, you know, another $60,000. Right. And it gets a little iffy for me, so I like to do it up front. So it would be a status check. So that should handle everything in 19 CF 1155. Um, in that case, there was originally seven counts. No, no, I'm sorry. That's 1155. There was originally eight counts. He is only pleading with four. So it is a statewide entering and all process at this time counts five through eight? Yes, sir, but I will do that orally and then back that up with a written uh, pleading to that effect. Okay. The so evidence, it says for the purposes of the record, I just want to put on the record that the evidence did not bear out to support the final four counts, so that um, was not even a complete count. Okay. So the null prompt status check on 19 CF 1155 will also be on 6 4 at 9. Again, I do that just to make sure the, that paperwork gets filed. I was a prosecutor for a long time, and those cases were never just left open, so I kind of make that a habit. Uh, going on to the, um, 
to 1154. Mr. Sarabia, we're, um, the state is going to be null crossing counts two, three, four, and five. Do you have a written null cross at this time? No, Judge, we're gonna follow that up after the police. All right, so that null cross for counts two, three, four, and five, status check will be that same date, six, four, at nine. And the state is gonna allow Mr. Massett, in this case, to plead to the lesser on count one, of aggravated assault of a law enforcement officer with a firearm, correct? Correct. And defense is agreeing that there was a firearm used in this case, correct? Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. All right, and that's 784.072A and 784.021, which is with the firearm, and the state is waiving the minimum mandatory on count one with the lesser aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. And the min-man on that would be? Three years. Three years. Is that correct? Correct, Judge. All right. Um, there is no probation to follow on this case, so it's going to be straight time. Um, and again, on this case, you're going to have 742 days. For the clerk, the state had indicated, and I wanted to make sure it's clear on the record, that count one now includes as a victim not only Sergeant Lindsay, who spoke already, that would also include the victim, Sergeant Mark Erickson which was the victim in count two, Corporal George McKnight, who is the victim in count three, Deputy Nicholas Carmack, who was the victim in count four, and Deputy Thomas Borman, who spoke, who was the victim in count five. State, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. All right, so they are now all considered victims for count one as a, as, as a whole. Um, any objection to that defense? No, Your Honor. And then counts two, three, four, and five are null cross uh, orally, and the status check for the written null cross will be June 4th at 9. Counts six and seven will be as charged, an adjudication, and a concurrent 36 months um, Department of Corrections, same credit time served of 742 days and he will forfeit all firearms seized at, the, uh, at that incident with the SWAT team. That's correct, right. Your Honor. All right, State, anything else that I've missed? Um, I know we went over it pretty fast the other day. I wanna make sure Mr. Manson understands what he's pleading to. Uh, yes, I forfeit all firearms and ammunition. Okay. And also, uh, I don't recall you indicating there's $5,607.50 of investigative cost to the Sheriff's Office. Correct. And also a $100 on our case. Okay, there, so there's gonna be $5,607.50 to the Sheriff's Office. Because this is straight time, that will be a lien. I'll have to get with the clerk's office to set up a payment plan. Okay. There's $100 to FDLE. There's $550 in court costs and fines. There's $100 to the state attorney for their request. This is an aggravated assault, so there is a 201-151, yes, 201-151 surcharge uh, for the aggravated assault. All those costs are not a condition of probation, so they will be a lien against him and have to set up a, a payment plan with the clerk's office. So he's gonna have two di different things going on. He's gonna be paying probation um, when he gets out for the probation and the statewide probation, and then he's gonna be getting with the clerk's office to pay off the costs for the um, other case, which he's getting straight time for. Any questions about that? Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Massett, are you ready to go? All right, and um, for the record, I just want to make sure that it's clear that this was a plea agreement worked out between the state and the defense and the court had nothing to do with this because if I did, I have to agree with the sergeant that Mr. Massett is getting quite a deal. I don't get involved in these plea agreements. I take these plea agreements as long as they're legal and lawful, which this is. But Mr. Massett, I want you to understand that you're getting probation to follow your prison sentence. And if you violate the terms of your probation in a willful or substantial manner, you can still get up to 10 years in state prison on a violation just on these cases. 
We're not talking about the sentencing on the trial case. I'm just talking about the one. And it would, in, in fact, what would happen is count three, if you violated, you would be sentenced and if any sentence you served would finish and then you would go back on probation and then you could be subject to another five years if you violated that term of probation. You understand that? Okay. All right. Um, have you, uh, do you have any questions about the plea that your attorneys have worked out with the state attorney's office here in Pasco Pinellas and the statewide prosecutor's office? Do you have any questions whatsoever before we go forward? No. All right. Then go ahead and sign the plea forms that have been provided. They're right in front of you. All right, sir, are you ready to go? Yes. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, you put your hand down, state your name. Bill Massett. How old are you, Mr. Massett? 70 years old. How far in school have you gone? I'm a medical doctor. Can you read and write English? Were you able to go over the plea form that you just signed with your lawyers prior to today? Yes. Now you understand that um, you're being sentenced on a uh, aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer, which I believe is a level two, uh, a second degree felony state, is that correct? Second degree felony level six. Yeah. Okay. Which could have been punishable by 15 years in state prison. And then you're also being sentenced on four additional third degree felonies. Each could have been punishable by five years, so that's another 20. So altogether, you could have gotten 35 years in state prison with a three-year minimum mandatory on what you're being sentenced here today. You understand that? Yes, ma'am. And you understand that by entering this plea, you're giving up all of the constitutional rights that are on your plea form which includes the right to a trial by jury on all counts, all charges. I was ready to go to do your trial. You're giving up your right to call witnesses or to testify or not testify. You're giving up your right to raise any defenses, motions to suppress any stops, searches, seizures, statements that you made. You're also giving up the right to appeal all matters relating to the facts in all cases. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Are you doing this freely and voluntarily? Yes, ma'am. Has anybody forced or coerced you into entering this plea? No, ma'am. Are you currently under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or prescription medication of any kind? No, ma'am. Are you taking any prescription medication whatsoever at the jail? Yes, ma'am. All right. Is any of the medication for any mental health diagnosis? No, ma'am. Is the medication that you have taken, did you take it as prescribed within the last 24 hours? Yes, ma'am. Is there anything about that medication or the reason for that medication that's having you have a hard time understanding what you're doing here today? No, ma'am. 
Are you satisfied with the help and advice of your attorney? Yes, ma'am. And you understand if you are not a United States citizen, this will cause deportation? Yes, ma'am. You also understand if you have any convictions at all for sexually violent or sexually motivated offenses, this plea could cause you to be held indefinitely if at a civil trial you're found to be a sexual violent predator. Do you understand that? Did you say sexual? Yeah. I'm not saying it applies to you. I have to read it to every single person going to the Department of Corrections. So you can answer yes, and we pretty much understand it doesn't apply to you, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's kind of like the uh, citizen question. I have to tell everybody that. I get that look a lot, okay? All right. Counsels, do you stipulate to a factual basis? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Does either um, statewide or the state need to put a factual basis on the record? I pretty much know this case inside and out, but if you feel like you need to put a factual basis, feel free. Uh, we feel this Arnold did an adequate job. I, I think he did a fine job. Um, statewide, do you wish to put a uh, factual basis on the record? If it's not required, I've read the probable cause affidavit. Uh, we've done multiple motions. I've heard from both sides about the facts in this case, but if you feel it necessary, I'll give you that time. No, that's the only thing I do want to put on the record is the reason behind our negotiation was primarily because the victim promptly proffered one resolution. Um, and during his deposition, he was asked how he wanted the case resolved and his desires were encompassed within this plea negotiation. And we gave great deference to Mr. Crawford because he actually suffered the most from the actions of uh, Mr. Massa and Alan Okay, all right. I have read the probable cause affidavit. I'll find probable cause on all counts, all charges. I'll accept your plea. I'll find that you're alert, intelligent, that you freely and voluntarily entered your plea, that you understand your rights, you waived your rights, and you have been represented by counsel, whom you express satisfaction. Um, first, in case number 19 CF 11, actually, I'll do it this way. Number 19 CF 1155, which is the statewide case on counts one and two. Um, this is a guilty plea, correct? Yes, now, that's correct. I just want to make sure. Uh, with a guilty plea, I'll adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to 36 months in the Department of Corrections, with credit time served of 742 days. This sentence will be concurrent with case number 19, um, but concurrent with. 19 CF 1155, count three. So on count, he'll be on five years of probation. Yeah, I'm on with this. And what I want Mr. Massa to understand is that if he is found in violation of probation based on how I read score sheets, this would be included as a violation with count three which would put everything on the score sheet at the same time, and he would probably score somewhere in the amount of 14 years in the Department of Corrections at the bottom. So he has all the reasons to stay on the straight and narrow, and um, he'll be, the consequences of not doing so are very high for him, extremely high for him. I could have given him prison, but this is a, a actually a more serious sentence because if he violates the terms of his probation, and if he is, as I think the sergeant described him, as a psychopath, he's not gonna be able to finish probation. Most psychopaths can't, because they can't follow directions, because they wanna do everything the way they wanna do it. So, Mr. Massett, um, I am sentencing you to a, a five years of probation on the trial case, and it will be consecutive to your prison sentence but concurrent with count three of your statewide case. There'll be $550 in court costs and fines. Statewide, is there any additional cost in this case? Because we encompass all of those in the cost that we provided in the other case. Okay, so it, it carries over that it's a combined amount. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so I don't need to add any others. It'll be $550 in court costs on that case, and you'll have 30 days to appeal the set the trial case. So Mr. Massey, you have two different things going on, just so we're clear. You have my sentencing on the trial. You're more than welcome to appeal the sentence, the trial, all that. 
Um, you also have the plea on the other cases, which you do have a right to appeal the sentence, but none of the facts of that case. So you may appeal the trial, I don't know, that's your right. Uh, there's clearly more to appeal there, but you'll have to make that decision with your lawyers, but you only have 30 days to make that decision. Do you understand that, sir? Okay, any other questions from you? All right, 30 days to appeal. Anything from me, any side? Hold on, Mr. Mass, one second. Just a brief mention with regards to the psychological evaluation on uh, the probation, I just want to note for the Department of Corrections if that could also include an evaluation or a mindfulness of his neurocognitive issues that were documented in uh, mental health reports. You can send a, a, a memo to probation. Okay. I don't get involved in that. I, I clearly don't tell psychologists what to do. I barely tell lawyers what to do. So, all right, uh, but please send a memo to them and uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll appreciate that and forward that to the psychological evaluation. All right, um, Mr. Bastian, you have 30 days to appeal everything. Thank you, sir. We've excused. You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Judge, may I have a I have this worksheet on practicing medicine. Sure. 